When you think about agriculture in Hawaii and buying local, fruits and vegetables might come to mind first. But what about local beef? Raising cattle has been happening here for centuries. In fact, cattle is the state's fourth most valuable agricultural commodity. However, the business of getting local beef to island consumers is challenging. So we're asking if Hawaii can have a viable beef industry. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The history of cattle in Hawaii starts in 1793 when six cows and a bull were gifted to Kamehameha the Great. The king created a 400-acre pasture and placed a kapu on killing them so that they could multiply. Today, it's a multi-million dollar industry that involves competing and cooperating stakeholders and a lot of constraints. And despite endless calls to increase local food production, only about 20% of calves born here are used for local consumption, while most beef is still imported. We're asking our panel tonight how we can get more local beef from pasture to plate. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Michelle Galimba is a beef cattle rancher in the Kau District on Hawaii Island. Her family started Kuahivi Ranch in 1993 by leasing abandoned sugarcane fields. Michelle is also a Hawaii County Council member for District 6, which runs from Volcano to South Kona. Lonnie Petrie is the owner of the Kapapala Ranch, a state leasehold property on Hawaii Island. The ranch was founded in 1860 on a lease signed by Kamehameha IV and has been operated by Lonnie's family for the past 47 years. She's also the vice president of the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council. Derek Kreisu is the executive vice president at KTA Superstores, the locally owned grocery store opened in 1916 and has now served several locations across Hawaii Island. Derek grew up on a plantation and has been a longtime champion of food sustainability. And Hunter Hevelin is the founder of Supersistence, a Hawaii-based consulting firm. He collaborates with various clients to help shape policies and strategies to strengthen our local food systems. Let me start off with uh, Lottie Petrie. Uh, what's the difference between the way cattle is raised in Hawaii and the way cattle is raised on the mainland? Nothing. I mean, our, our industry is compartmentalized. So you have your seed stock people, you have your cow-calf producers, you have your stocker operators, you have your feedlots you're finishing, and then your slaughterhouses. So that compartmentalization is industry-wide. Um, so there's not a lot of difference. Well, in terms of, I'm asking more like in terms of, I'm picturing a, a big mainland feedlot versus a pasture in Hawaii. That's why I made the distinction, because we <clears throat> are very compartmentalized. Um, yes, that segment of the industry that finishes cattle or puts that last 300 pounds of gain. Um, it, it puts the internal marbling, the, the very quality that, that consumers are looking for, um, is done on the mainland in the feedlots. Uh, Derek Carisu at KTA, do people want local beef? Or do they have to pay a premium for, for the beef that they buy from uh, that comes from local? Well, 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 for us, you know, um, we've been always selling local beef. In fact, today about 40% of our beef sale is local. You know, well, and, that's uh, more than the oh, rest yeah, of the state, and right? a lot of them is uh, on ground beef and stuff like that. But you know, um, I guess like people like me, I was mean, born and raised in, on local beef, so we're kind of used to the flavor and the taste. Um, and I think there's a lot of us locals on our island, you know, love local beef. But, you know, the amazing thing about it is that I think, um, you know, it's better for you. It's healthier. And, um, and the industry has come a long way. Today's beef is much more tender, more tender and, you know, um, uh, and tastier than those in the past. So, yeah, so people are 40% of our beef sale is local, local beef. You know, Michelle uh, Glimba, at your ranch, I know that you do produce cattle that are at a quality grade that can produce steaks as opposed to just ground beef. How do you do that? How is that uh, not a feedlot? How does it work on your farm or your ranch? Um, so, right, we, 
It's 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 a it's a difficult process, and it's very um, very much um, exposed to the risks of weather. So we have to um, really pay close attention to what's going on um, with the weather. But basically, um, and as Lonnie said, there's there's not a lot of difference really industry wide in how you sort of pasture cattle. I mean, we have to basically keep them on fresh grass all the time, which is something that Lani does very, very well with her cattle. The difference is that we keep them on pasture um, all the way up until we sell them here locally um, versus sending them to the mainland for that final um, sort of period on in a, in a feedlot on grain. I guess what I'm kind of asking is, we picture these mainland feedlots. Um, is there a lot of grass-fed beef that's coming from the mainland as well? No, there really isn't a lot of grass-fed beef that comes to Hawaii um, from the mainland. There is some that comes from New Zealand and Australia, but actually I think most of the grass-fed beef that's raised on the mainland stays there because there's there's just almost there's a Local grass-fed is almost, you say them together. The, the kind of person that wants to have grass-fed beef also wants, is really, you know, really cares about their local economy usually and supporting um, their local farmers and ranchers. So yeah, there isn't a lot of, I think, movement of grass-fed beef in the United States to Hawaii. Hunter Heflin, in your, in your research, what is the, um the challenge with Hawaii beef versus mainland beef? Is it purely just cost so much to operate here or? Certainly ha Hawaii has higher costs of production uh, for a variety of, of goods. Um, part of that is just the cost of land, cost of labor, cost of any power that you might need. Um, but there's also our tax structures. So when we implemented our general excise tax, uh, in the, the late 50s, there was recognition at the time that it would increase the cost of food. And while multiple other states, which is to say every other state but ours, affords sales tax breaks for the variety of inputs for agricultural outputs, um, we only afford an exemption for agricultural fuels. So there's opportunities um, across the agricultural system, and cattle industry being one, to lower the costs of production by modifying our tax systems. Lenny Peter, in, in, in your guys' operation, what's the biggest cost factor for you in terms of the raising of the cattle? Labor. Um, <clears throat> and weed control. I, I think you have to, let me tag on to what Michelle was saying. All land is not equal. The grass can look green but where we're from on the southeast side of the Big Island, um, we're a half a million years, our, our ground is a half a million years newer than the north side of the island. <laughs> so just because grass looks green and it's all out there, it's not equal. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about taking these animals from 400 pounds live weight, weaned from their mothers, and taking them up to 13, 12 or 1300 pounds. That 800 pounds is a lot of growth, and it takes a lot of groceries. Um, not only is all grass not equal, um, tropical grasses are different than your continental grasses. Uh, tropical grasses, as they ripen, will put the nutrition back down to the root, whereas um, your crested wheat grasses and your fescues and your, your continental-type grasses they're really grains, right? They're, their value, uh, their nutritional value is held up in the leaf. And so even though grass looks all green and it could be greener on the other side of the fence, it's, it's not all the same. So we can't raise very many, we can't raise grass-fed beef at our place. Um, and there are some locations statewide that can, but not everybody can. You know, with, there's an interesting question from a, um a viewer, a caller calls in, do these cattle companies in Hawaii compete with each other in terms of price or do they pool all their products together to sell to the mainland under one name company? That's a, that's a big uh, topic. But let me start off, uh, Michelle, Weed. Um, I know you took quite a long time to develop your cattle to the point where that, that you did. Um, 
is there competition among ranchers and does that actually get in the way of uh, a healthy industry? Um, I wouldn't say that there's competition between ranchers. I think more, we cooperate a lot more than we compete. I mean, you know, there's a little bit of competition, but I think we um, mostly are faced with, you know, the same kind of issues and we're com competing really just um, to get, to use the the um, natural resources that we have, which in Hawaii really is the grass, year-round grass. That is our competitive advantage. Um, so we're all sort of maybe competing to figure out how to use it the best, but we're not really competing against each other. I mean, there's a huge um, culture in of uh, ranching in Hawaii that we all go to each other's brandings and help out for those periods when, you know, you need a, a lot of help. So I would say that um, that, that isn't really a, a factor of how the industry works, but... Um, okay, let me, yeah. uh, let me move on too. To, uh, there's, I've got a couple of questions about the taste of grass-fed beef. So Dan from Wahiwa points out that uh, Chef Alan Wong did a blind test date taste with local grass-fed beef versus mainland feedlot beef. He and his kitchen staff chose the grass-fed. No hormones or antibiotics. Tastes better and is better for you. Two strong selling points. Should legislators provide marketing funding to sustain, if not grow, Hawaii's grass-fed beef for local consumption? We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, but also, grass, another comment, Simon from Big Island, grass-fed beef from Hawaii has no marbling and doesn't taste good like all grass-fed beef. It is tough and I wouldn't buy it. Uh, Derek hmm. Carisu, um, can you respond to that? I mean, you mentioned well, earlier well, that people like it, but yeah. So you know, you know, Alan Wong and I did a taste test. Uh, this was at the Hawaii Executive Collaborative, and I um, it was down at uh, Mount Alani Hotel, and a whole room of different executive there. I think it was about close to 200 people. So we cooked the the, the U.S. choice beef, and we cooked the grass-fed beef, ground beef, and um, Se and we didn't season it, we didn't do anything. And, um, you know, it was kind of like surprising because the temperature, everything was safe. We plated it out and uh, we, we fed it to the crowd, grass-fed beef and, and um, U.S. choice beef from the mainland. And you know, it was 50-50. It was 50-50. 50 wanted the grass-fed and 50 wanted the um, choice. And, and, and I was kind of like shocked, you know. and. Um, because, you know, grass-fed beef is an acquired flavor, and I think one of the comments that was made is the tenderness. You know, and, and that is something that it has a bad stigma, you know, uh, local beef. And, um, um, and uh, so for, for me, um, it's very important that we, you start to see lack, you start to grade. If you want grass-fed beef to become a premier beef, I mean, they gotta be some kind of standard, I think, it has to be done so that, you know, the image stays there because you can eat a real good grass-fed beef, and it, it, it is amazing, the, the, the flavor there, the tenderness there, and everything else. And yet, you could eat a grass-fed beef that, that is uh, kind of scrawny, it's like a low-grade beef, and, and it will be tough. I mean, there's no question about that. Yeah. that. That goes back to the risk factor that Michelle was talking about, um, dry weather. You take an animal that's on a, a, a diet of, say, 18% protein, that's what's in your grass, and their place, especially the trade wind blows off the ocean, and what within a week you can be dealing with the cattle eating more like straw, 8% protein, maybe less, and that affects the quality of meat immediately. Yeah, so, so it's, it's tough to manage, like, mm -hmm. like Michelle was saying. Well, another part of it is um, the, there's a, a little bit more skill required in yeah. Um, cooking grass-fed beef like I, you know I think corn-fed beef it's so uniform you can kind of just it's gonna be the same whenever whenever you get it because it's fed all the same things versus uh, grass-fed beef it'll be you know different grasses different and different parts of the the animal um, have different degrees of tenderness so I mean, you can look at that as a problem or you can look at it as an opportunity. I was just in um, Seattle. There's an amazing restaurant there named Bateau. 
and they have every single piece of the, the carcass um, up on a board. And so they, they cook every piece of the carcass differently. And so it's just kind of a different way of looking at eating beef. You know, if you want it to be extremely uniform, then you're probably better off with your conventional grain-fed beef, let me, but let me, yeah. Let me go to Hunter Hevelin on this. So taste aside, it sounds like it's, it's mixed. It's not a factor in, in preventing people from, it, from this product being successful. What are the real impediments in Hawaii to the success of this industry? To the success of this industry? Um, well, I, I appreciate you not forcing me to adjudicate other people's palates. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, in I, terms, I, of, the, moved along in terms of the success of the industry, I think that the, the primary competition, I mean, looking in the, the evolution of Hawaii's, we could say, dependence upon imported goods, um, cattle and beef being one of them, that the competition that we largely face, while there is um, internal competition for land access or access to processing facilities, that the broader um, system that we're sort of up against is imported um, products, right? And imported beef is, is uh, no different. So thinking back to, I think it was around in the 30s and 40s, by, in 1900, about all of our beef was locally grown. Um, by the late 30s, early 40s, it was around 25%. And by mid-century, that was starting to tip. And so thinking about with our increase in population, we significantly increased the amount of beef that we were consuming, but couldn't keep up with the demand for, from local sources. I remember an analysis that someone did for me about bread. <clears throat> and it was like, well, we were all eating fresh bread made here until someone figured out how to freeze it and then unfreeze it, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you could ship it to Hawaii and undercut everybody all the fresh bread. And you know, and, and I wonder if there's some technology advancement that, that created that dynamic. But I want to ask, Dwayne, I'm sorry, I want to ask Dwayne, uh, Derek, Dwayne, the <laughs> brother. Uh, I've got a couple questions here from people. Why can't we, is there a good reason why we can't find more local beef products in our grocery stores? That's Emma and Bililani. Aside from KTA, where can I get local beef, a caller? Uh, I mean, how available is it to you as a, as a retailer um, and, and to other retailers? I know you are probably in contact with them. Is, is, is there more demand for local beef than the local uh, suppliers are, are able to, to generate? Well, you know, and, um, you know, as far as I know, um, we always sold local beef. And the only reason why we started to bring in um, beef on the main end was because we had mainly competition coming in. And um, um, so we were forced to um, bring in some of the mainly beef. But during that time, what, what Michelle and Lani said was, you know, like the education in cooking, you know. So I, I remember writing one book called Big Island Meat Magic, and it was um, showing people that, you know, local beef is just as good if you know how to cook it, you know. And um, when you go to some fine restaurants now, I think even at, down at the Four Seasons, they do serve local beef. Well, what, okay, okay. I'm, I, I like to cook. What, what's yeah. the trick? I mean, they, probably the way they, they, they process it or they... No, you know, in they, terms of cooking. Okay, yeah, I, if I, I get mean, if I buy myself a local steak, how am I going to cook it different from a mainland steak? So you don't yeah. want to overcook it. Yeah. It's very important to not overcook local beef. Um, so when I have my, yeah. my, my beef thermometer and I've got my beef <laughs> th thing on the fridge that says go up to 145 degrees, should I, like, crank it down a few degrees uh, for local beef? And oh. go up. Huh? Yeah, actually, hotter, yeah, faster, hotter, hotter and faster. Oh, okay. Okay. And then you the outside. Yeah, and then, you know, you don't try and um, eat a round, a grass-fed round as a steak. That's, you're just going to be very, very unhappy. Right. So you're, right. yes. So, I think uh, the consumers just need, to, we, we don't cook anymore as a society. <laughs> And people that do know how to use a round or a chuck. Or yes. A, um, so, yeah, but everybody thinks of a steak, and that's just such a small percentage of the total carcass. And that's one of the big challenges of, you know, keeping meat here is the total utilization, right? The, you know, you're talking about the, the loin meat, the rib, the, the short loin, that's the tenderloin in the New York, and the sirloin, that's only like 18% of your carcass. You still got to sell the rest. Oh. Right? 
You so. see, that was the key to how our program started. Uh, we used Kulana Foods and, you know, whatever was um, we we're long on, uh, we created value added products with it. So, you know, you got pipi cola, now we use pipi cola in our poke, you know, and th it does real well. I mean, we're stuck with this piece called Claude. It's uh, uh, right above the shoulder and also some of the top rounds. But we've been using that for fundraisers, um, teriyaki place out in the parking lot, you know. And so, you know, you're grabbing things that you're long on uh, and, and try to turn it into some kind of other value added products because. To make a money, I mean, you gotta sell the whole beef. I mean, whole you can't be stuck with anything. And the worst thing you wanna do is um, sell hamburger because it's the it's the cheapest thing not that anymore. can be utilized. No, for no not anymore. No, not anymore. <laughs> exactly. That's changing the, the and game. And hey, people That's even buying the, the bones game. for the bath food now and, and <laughs> right, stuff like yeah. that. I think that, that that really highlights the importance of you know the where a company is situated and yes. the community that it's responsible to or accountable to and the ex the, the lengths that it will go yes. to ensure that it's supporting the, the producers and the, the community that it's a part of. And, and I, yeah. With the, with the supermarket revolution, as you, know, you mm -hmm. alluded to, right, in the 50s, as these new, bigger national companies were coming in, right. they're bringing in all these other goods, of course, with the increase of cold storage, as you commented on, mm -hmm. that right, that's yeah. shi drastically shifted the landscape of food availability and the competition landscape. So I think thinking concertedly about where the, to whom these uh, firms are accountable to has a significant uh, impact for the ways that they act in our in our systems and thus what ends up on our plate. Let me show you what it is. Yeah, no, I think Hunter really brings up a really good point and something that in our evolution on our ranch has been really important and it's sort of beyond the money part. Um, when we first started out, we shipped all our cattle to the mainland because that was just the you know standard operating procedure. And at a certain point, well, my mother was really the, the inspiration for this. She really wanted to ha keep cattle here. And it sort of lined up with a, a low point in the cattle market because the cattle market does this thing. Mm -hmm. And so at a low point, it, you know, ranchers really have a hard time making money here. Um, so why not try something crazy? And so we, we tr went into this keeping cattle here, grass finishing them, um, and the, you just get this amazing feeling when you can see your community eating the food that you produce. It's like you never want to go back um, to just, you know, sending it all off. Even though it's not making you rich. No, I mean, it's, I mean, we do all right, actually, with, with our grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because people want it. We get such great support from our community, so Lonnie I just want to shout you, out to them. Yeah, let me ask, Lonnie, <laughs> how is the industry doing in terms of, I mean, I, I know there's way more ranches. We always talk about Parker Ranch. We, you know, you've got a good-sized ranch. Cup of is a good-sized ranch. But, you know, there's many, many small sources of cattle. How is the rest of the folks doing with, uh, with the business of raising cattle for beef? Um, well... There's people that are in the business of raising beef, and that's what they do, like Michelle's family, my family. And then there's a lot of people that raise beef that it's a, it's a, I don't even like the word hobby, it's, it's a passion. And they do it well, and they do it on the weekends, but they have full-time jobs. And so they look at, well, we look at numbers very um, methodically. We have to where there's a lot of supply in this state, well, nationwide, that people don't really care what it costs because they got some pasture from their grandma or whatever and, you know, keeping the grass down and they got 30 or 50 cows out there. Um, so as far as people that are watching their numbers, we wouldn't be in business if we weren't profitable. <coughs> Every year, no, um, but enough years that... Um, We've been there for 47. Uh, Derek, does, does the price of uh, local grass-fed beef um, compete with the mainland beef? You know, now, now it's a little cheaper. I mean, it's lower price than the mainland. You know, mainland beef price is suddenly sky, sky high now because of the, the freight factor and Supply. the prices has gone up. Supply. Yeah. We're in a nationwide you know. shortage. 
But, you know, buying local beef is, uh, to me, is so important because, you know, like, um, it helps the economy and everything else. I, I, Lani and, and Michelle come shopping in the store, you know, and it goes, you know, they, they know we support it. And, you know, um, and to your question, you know, earlier was, uh, how can they get local beef up in Oahu? And I think, Michelle, you, you guys sell to Whole Foods, right? You can go to mm -hmm. Whole Foods, you can go to Foodland. Safeway, a Foodland. I mean, there's... They're my competitor, but we're all friends because we're in the same business. But they, they, they do sell local beef. You well, know. you know, I, I got a question from Claude. Are there slaughterhouses in Hawaii? And um, th there are, but there aren't very many. And, you know, how does that um, affect the industry? Because there's an X number of brands of, of, of local beef. And it gets confusing sometimes because the names will change and, and so on. Um, I don't know who wants to bite on this. Oh, sorry, pardon the pun. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, the, is the slaughterhouse infrastructure enough to support the industry? Well, I think th right now it is, although it's unequally distributed. Um, so there's a lot of slaughterhouse capacity on Oahu. I think there's um, pretty good slaughterhouse capacity on Hawaii Island, Maui. I think it's it's in the not in such a good place, um, and Kauai. I'm not real up on it, but I think they could use a little more slaughterhouse capacity. So it really depends on the island, but overall we're in a pretty good place actually. And we have, the interesting thing is we have sort of young people coming in and starting small slaughterhouses, um, so these modular um, slash mobile slaughterhouses. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting to see young people sort of going out on and doing these um, innovative things with slaughter. Did you want to add to that? I have a comment because we're talking like meat, just like it's meat. And I, I, I want to make the distinction here because um, there's, there's a cow, the cow, I'm going to compare it to a papaya tree. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's just compare it to a papaya tree. Okay, so the papaya tree <coughs> is, the, is the factory, right? It's the mother load, right? It's the papaya that we harvest, that's, that's the product. But after three or four years, the papaya tree needs to be cut down, right? So in our industry, um, a, a young heifer is grown and she starts to have calves by the time she's three. She starts to be a really good mother cow by the time she's five. But by the time she's 10, 11 years old, her productivity, her calves are getting smaller. You know, we all, we go to the dentist, they don't. <laughs> so, you know, no more teeth, the calf gets smaller. So at about 10, 11 years, ranchers will cut the papaya tree down. But in our industry, that cow still has a value. And that's, all of that meat stays here. And that is the grind that you're eating when you go to KTA, now at Safeway. Uh, Foodland, it's it's the the animal that <coughs> has passed her productive life, but she's still very good meat, delicious. The older an animal is, the more flavor it really has. Um, I feel that as, way about people too. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to what <laughs> we talk about grass-fed beef. Now, grass-fed beef, we're talking about that product, that papaya. Well, it's not fully mature yet, right? That that cow has that calf and she can raise it up to let's say four or five hundred pounds now where does it go mm. okay now we're talking about the grass-fed <clears throat> segment that's why i want to make that distinction right in the beginning is that you got the cow-calf producer and now he hands over that 400 pound animal to someone like michelle that's got the grass that can take them but she's not going to buy my cows calves because she's got her own but that, that section that, of the industry that's going to take that animal from 4 to 12 if you leave them in the state. And that's a different quality of beef than what we're talking about. So there, to me, there's quite a bit of local ground meat statewide. Yeah. And that's where it's coming from. Is that where the, most, of the industry, most of the money is to be made? Well, well you, you know, there's a lot of... I mean, 
there's a lot of cows out there, you know, even dairy cows, you know, and there's cow, cow cows, but you know, that's, that's part of the bottom line there. And, that's, yeah. and, and I think um, hopefully the, 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 the state uses those things, you know, ground beef in there, instead of importing it from the main. I mean, this is what we're talking and about. And that's where we've been short on slaughter exactly. capacity until the last few years. We should be using our own sustainable instead of beef. importing, right? You mean, yeah. the, you mean the, the, the ground beef? Well, trying to get <coughs> your your cull cows into where they can be harvested. You know, I didn't. I, I did a I did a series of stories um, at Hawaii News Now about the beef industry. What I discovered there's no there's no simple answer to a simple question, right? I mean, it's very complicated. One of the things that struck me was how much cattle move around in the course of their life in Hawaii. Of course, there's they get to a certain point where most of them are still being shipped out. As, as yearlings to the mainland for, for finishing and so on. But even the, one, the ones that stay, you'll move them from one pasture to another. You know, when you want to get them processed, you have to send them to another island, many of them. Um, I noticed that the slaughterhouse out at Kapolei was meg multiple times bigger than it needed to be for the current time. So is there growth potential here? It can, you know, how much potential is there for us, getting back to the original question of this show, can we ever really hope to be up and up or, or, or surpass mainland beef? Hunter, have a, what do you think about that question? I mean, I think the expansion of processing capacity is certainly affords an opportunity for expansion of the in industry overall, but it also, uh, I think, begs the question of what is going to fill that capacity in the meantime if our production is not at the extent that is currently needed to maintain operations. The uh, centralization of processing capacity in Oahu is something that has been noted across the industry for longer than I've been alive, um, probably at least double that. And so the kind of doubling down on that approach as opposed to something that might be more diversified. That Which is kind of what Michelle lower, was talking about, the smaller guys operating in multiple places. Well, or just something that's tailored for uh, a given island um, so that it's not requiring the additional transportation which adds additional cost. Uh, so let me um, go through some questions that we've gotten because um, this is kind of getting to the, the stage where we got to ask, you know, what's it going to take, right, to, to, to move to the next level. I mean, um, there's the question was how much red tape does uh, how much, where did it go? There's a question here. I wanted this person's name because it was a good question. How much red tape does it take to get, a, a, get beef to market in Hawaii? Is it, is it tremendously more difficult than on the mainland? Or Michelle, do you get a sense of that? I wouldn't say it. it's a matter of red tape. Um, it is, to, to build a slaughterhouse is an immense amount of red tape, like a regular. And it's both moment. federal and state red tape. Right, that's it's, that's and a lot of a lot of money, um, but to operate as ranchers, I wouldn't say that red tape is is the issue. But processing facilities are important, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I would start with the land, because you either got to have twice as much land or half as many cows, because it takes twice as long. It'll take two years. I, I mean, I don't know what you folks are doing, but. Um, you know, you're turning your inventory, you're taking that four weight to 1,200 pounds in 11 or 12 months on the mainland versus 24 maybe here. So, so on that point though, is there enough land to expand the industry? I don't think so. To, to meet local demand? I don't think so. Well, that's a pretty big limiting factor. Then. I would say. <laughs> we did have one person ask, well, we can grow sweet corn in Hawaii, why can't we grow grain yeah. corn? Essentially implying that, you know, maybe we, we should have, uh, you know, feedlot situation. And then you start running into environmental issues that people don't like to deal with here. But, I mean, it, should we be supporting our industry with, with uh, grain? Well, you know, at one point there was this biogenic operation in Kohala. And I think uh, they're raising their own feed corn. And um, I, I visited the place uh, several times, you know, in the past. Um, this was like 20, 30 years ago. But I think years, 40 years, years ago, ago. Yeah, <laughs> dating myself. <laughs> and and they're, they're, I, I think of, about like three, four, five years, they're no longer there, you know. So um, 
it, it, it was an amazing operation. You, you probably was a Hawaii. young girl yet, Lana. Yeah, you, you see that in Hawaii where things. people will, have, will try something innovative yeah. and it just, it looks like it's going to be successful, then it just fades away. I just see, just see, see away. that all the time. You have to pay attention to your costs. Yeah. You know, another factor what's happening here in the industry is that, you know, we, we lack labor, you know. Yeah. Um, both the slaughter facilities, even retails, you know, meat shops and everything. I mean, we lack labor. Nobody, I guess nobody want to work in a cold room and, you know, uh, hard work and, you know, and, and we, we need to improve our labor situation. I think that's why we have a lot of bottlenecks at slaughter f facilities. I don't think they have enough labor also. Yeah. Oh, of course. So, um, okay, so it seems like, this is Myron and Kahului, it seems like there is a change in attitude needed. Support local beef and the industry will grow, creating more jobs if people are there to <laughs> fill them. Uh, we can keep our money here instead of supporting companies thousands of miles from here. We may, be, may have to pay a little bit more to be sustainable, but it's worth it. But it sounds like we don't even, it, it's the price at the pump or the price at the store is, is not our issue. It's, it's expanding uh, good products and getting good products grown and processed. I mean, is that where, where we're at? I'd say it's a production mm. issue. It is a production issue. Uh, for me, I can't, I can't do that. Um, and a risk issue. I mean, Michelle brought it up right in the beginning. And that was going to be one of my topics is last night on Hawaii News Now, mm. did you see the map of the state of Hawaii and the drought situation? Mm. It's, it's statewide. Once you make a commitment to keep that animal here, that's it. And you hit a drought. And then the slaughterhouse isn't happy with animals that aren't 1,200 pounds. They're 10, yeah. they're 1,000. That hurts their productivity, their costs. So it's, it's, a, it's a domino effect. Well, I think the question that you asked for this, this show is, can we have a viable beef industry? And I would say we have had a viable industry for, you know, 160, 170 years. And I, I think we will continue to have a viable beef industry. Will it, will be, we be completely, I, I don't think we'll be, um, feeding, not not being, not importing. We will continue to import. We're not going to be 100 yes, percent self-sufficient for beef. Yes, we will not, unless and you know, and it's a, it's goes both ways. I mean, if I think people need to support the industry that is there, um, and it might grow a little, but it'll never get to 100 percent of, and because 50 percent of people want corn-fed beef anyway. So, yes. Well, and the 100% self-sufficiency isn't necessarily a more sort of resilient system for our yeah, food yeah. provisioning overall. So. Right. Because we're 100% dependent on tourism and look where it's gotten us, I mean, in a way. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, I um, just, you know, if you keep an industry stays profitable and can stay in business, um, <clears throat> I just want to reflect on the missile scare back in 2018. I don't know what you guys were thinking about, but that 40 minutes was uh, <coughs> very time consuming. I was like, wow. Because mm -hmm. some of our families lived through Pearl Harbor. My parents both did. Um, so it was a very humbling 40 minutes. But my husband and I sat down and figured out what we could do to feed our community very quickly because we had a whole bunch we had 750 of those five weight calves that are beautiful eating. Are they the most, um, you know, utilizing their growth potential? No, but in an emergency, all that meat was here. Mm. And right. I think one of the things, I, I'm vice president of the Cattlemen's Council, but I'm very <coughs> uh, concerned about our industry getting ahead of the eight ball because I think I learned a good lesson during that 2018, is let's get ahead of the, the eight ball so that we can have a supply in an emergency that gets to Derek's store. So healthy, uh, a healthy industry doesn't necessarily have to be, so it wipes out the competition from the mainland. It right. could be part of a balancing act. Real quickly, a couple of questions. Um, George on Maui says, Maui needs a state-operated owned slaughterhouse so the cattle won't need to be shipped off island. Has the state been a help or hindrance in terms of the development and growth of a local beef industry? That's Eric in 
Kailo, we talked about how we've got excess um, processing capability on Oahu, about right on the Big Island, no. but you don't think it's about right on the Big Island? No, we need a lot more processing on the uh, slaughter capacity on the Big Island. Okay, and then, but, but Maui has very little slaughter capacity. So the, the, the question overall is, what's the role of the state in at least helping grow the industry a little bit more? Well, we previously had a state meat inspection program that helped at least cover some of the costs that are now borne by operators that need to be, or rather overseers that need to be brought in through USDA processes. So that's one opportunity for the state to pony up um, in a mechanism that could help lower the cost of what ends up on the plate. The farm to school program. I think Maui Cattle Company had a heck of a time with that. They got the contract and then, I don't know all the particulars, but yeah, things like the farm, uh, farm to school really helps. Right. Having a, having a, a demand there. And I think important for the state purchasing goals that we've established for ourselves um, to increase the quotient that we are consuming locally that's produced locally is uh, laudable. But I think we also need to be very particular about what we're actually, the, the provenance of what we're consuming. And currently as it's written, the 51% standard doesn't actually specify whether the cost. Um, What's a 51%? Sorry, the 51% standard for goods that qualify for the reporting by state departments about how much they're, uh, the quotient of local goods that they're okay. purchasing over from their total um, food purchase. So currently, you could add the costs of processing into that, or even uh, have other non local goods incorporated into value added products that are considered in, as part of that 51%. Um, and so I think it's important to really set a standard, particularly for single, pro single ingredient products, to ensure that when we say this is local beef, that it is solely local beef, just in the way that we would expect when we're buying a local carrot, that it's a local carrot. But the mechanisms that are providing for our school food programs and others, and ideally we'll do more so in the, in the future, don't necessarily have those standards. I see what you're saying. Mm. Um, That's really important. Derek Creasu in yes. KTA. You see, you see it from both sides. You see it from the c customer side. You see it from the retail side. We all do a little bit, but you, you're in the middle of it. What would your advice be to the state, the industry, um, other stores about how to make this industry grow at least some and continue to grow? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because I, I think and I've been thinking about it for quite some time and experience, with, through all my experiences, um, I've kind of learned a lot. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be really important is that we got to create one, one standard, one local beef standard, so that the meat is consistent. You know, There's so much inconsistency. What, what Lonnie would bring, what Michelle would bring, might be great beef, but you know, we might have beef coming from other places that, you know, it's... Maybe it goes a drought, maybe the grass is, is bad or, you know. Um, so there's no standard. I think that's number one. The second thing I think, which let, I... Let me, let me interrupt for one second, because I just wanted the, the, the process that we're talking about here, right? From what I understand, you know, the, the processing plant can, like they can make a hamburger 30% fat or 5 or 10% fat, yeah. right? So they, they can blend different things yeah. would that be where but the standard would have to be met is I, that I'm, I'm not talking about ground beef like ground beef is going to be tender anyway okay so right? that's that's what I'm talking about those steaks right okay and I think that's why when you know there's all kinds of complaints about beef it's it's not tender you get right? one bad one and you make up your conclusion yeah. for right now, but there's everybody. there's prime there's choice there's you know there's different grades and I think grading system might be part of the solution but I think what also got to happen, and hopefully the state could kind of help, uh, I think it got to be a little bit more value-added um, products coming out of the, the, the cattle industry. And when you do value-added products, I mean, you could grab these beef and you could ship it outside and you could also export it. So you know, what's the value? Give me some examples of value-added products. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, um, let's say corned beef. Corned beef is value-added, right? Tipicaula is value-added. I mean, I always told myself, Wow, why don't we make a puleo meat, you know, a tender puleo meat grade? Everybody throws things over the fire. I mean, create value added. Like, tax, there's a Texas brisket. You know, Texas is really good at that. I mean, we should do stuff like that here, you know. 
um, create more value-added products so that we're able to ship it all over the world because Hawaii is a special brand. You know, and they know whatever you buy from Hawaii, you know, the product is going to be going to be clean, tender, and under this beautiful weather, right? So, you know, more value-added items, and I think a, a better grading system so the high-quality beef can be sold in the market, and the lower-quality beef and those other non-tender cuts can be used for value-added products. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, let me ask. Lani Peter, this question: How does that work from the perspective of of a rancher? If you have this grading system, I guess it would, that would be at the processing plant where they say A, B, C. Is that okay? Does that work for you folks? Could I jump in here? Yeah. Actually, yeah. there's, yeah, there's yeah, 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 that's more of a me question. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> sorry, I, I, like I said, there's no there's no simple answer to a simple question. But go ahead. So sorry. yeah, I I think. Um, Something that's worked really well with Whole Foods that we worked we work with um, with uh, grass-fed beef is that they give us um, parameters and they're pretty simple parameters at least on paper to actually get them you know in practice as a rancher is not simple but um, they give us an age limit and um, and and a weight sort of bottom limit so an upper limit on the age of the cattle because. Cattle become tastier as they get older, but they also become tougher. So oh. we have to meet that that age limit, and then we have to make, meet the low. Uh, it has to be bigger than a certain size. And so between, and it's a pretty simple standard, mm -hmm. and it it really does hold our feet to the fire um, to get a quality animal out there. And it, and it, I guess it then instructs the rancher. This is what you need to do to get to this level, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. The other thing, you know, value added, as he's talking about, can be as simple as um, vacuum packing. Right. Because you can take a, an animal that's maybe a lesser quality and cryovac it and leave it for four weeks, and you have a totally different mm. cutability. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. You, dry age, wet age, yeah. same thing. I mean, they're different. The process of breaking down the proteins is what you're trying to do. This is actually very interesting. I'm just going to like, so, so when we talk about value added, we're talking about, generally speaking, another company or another yeah. individual entrepreneur that Absolutely. rises up and says, okay, I'm going to develop a, a, a packing plant that's going to vacuum seal stuff. I'm going to make corned beef. You know, and so where are those entrepreneurs and how do you get them into the system? We actually have them on a very small scale. There's, you know, folks that are doing um, I know I get beef jerky, beef at yeah. Foodland, yeah. Yeah. beef yeah. jerky, you know, and and branding it. And um, as Derek was saying, like that Hawaii brand just has a lot of cachet. So um, getting folks here, even I mean, even local folks want to buy Hawaii products, much less you know tourists wanting to go home. So there's, there is. I think there's a lot of opportunity for a viable beef industry in that sort of yeah, segment. Yeah, value added. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You know, Leeward Community College, thanks to the state, the state had put in 20 something million dollars. They, they do have like a value added center uh, that's, it's not open yet, but it's almost gonna open. It's being run by Leeward Community College. Uh, it's, it's up in Waiheawa. And um, you know, the, the whole purpose. In <laughs> yeah. yeah, the whole purpose is to, to help <laughs> agriculture with, you know, uh, create more value added products. And, you know, that, 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 that might be um, part of the solution because it's um, educational based. The students will be, you know, running different tests. And, you know, so if you want to make one pipi cola or you want to make a corned beef or, you know, there's a place to, to do it now. Um, Let me ask Hunter, when, when it comes to something like that, where you see a potential niche for, uh, for products, how do you get an industry to attracted to that? Does that take some sort of subsidies? Does that take some sort of support from the from the government or from somewhere else? Or does it just take innovation and entrepreneurialism and some level of investment? Well, I mean, value added as a market diversification approach is practiced by producers of all, all kinds of goods. Um, they figure it out themselves. Well, it, they figure it out themselves, but there are also maybe third parties that are, mm. you know, taking that um, risk that product and maybe taking on that risk as well. 
Uh, I think some of our, not necessarily as applicable when you're talking about meat and the concerns there, but the cottage industry and cottage food um, laws and, and allowances can help ensure that there are standards, but also enable uh, a, a, some of that industry to develop. I think part of the benefit of um, expanding the, the industry and the mechanisms that it has to distribute um, both locally and, you know, there's a mention of export, is that it increases the, the opportunity for production locally to, to increase overall. Let me, um, I, I, got I got several questions here, and, and we don't have a lot of time left, and I probably should have done this earlier. But I'm getting questions about sort of the <coughs> environmental impact of the industry because you know, on the mainland with the giant feedlots, there's, there's a lot of concern about environmental impact. Here, one question we have is, how would expanding or developing a beef industry be in compliance with climate change objectives for Hawaii? Is Gwendolyn from Iguanu. Um, and then is, let me ask Michelle this, is, is there, how environmentally is, how environmentally friendly or good for the environment is this industry, the grass-fed beef industry? Um, well, I would say grass-fed beef is of all the <coughs> kinds of beef that you could um, have is probably the most environmentally friendly because they're eating grass and um, that actually, well, number one, you're not sort of taking um, corn away from people eating it. You're cattle have this wonderful ability to digest cellulose and make meat. So I think it's um, actually a great product in that way. And um, they also, the, another really great thing about cattle is that they, they keep fuel loads down, which I think is, you know, as we become much more um, sensitive to that. Um, and- What does that mean, fuel loads? Well, basically, they're keeping the grass. Um, oh, and we, I see. Yes, and we've managing, had we've had some the talk agriculture. Of, yeah, yes, right, instead so. of let grass grow like crazy. Yes. Yeah. So, Garrett, you want I, was, yes. I was asked that question once uh, at this. Uh, um, it, it was a forum um, with, with vegetarians, you know, and um, I told them, you know, grass-fed beef is way better than than grain-fed. That, that you know, because they were talking about the methane gas and stuff like that. I mean, like you go to Lonnie's pasture, or you go to um, uh, um, Michelle's pasture, I mean, nice greenery, I mean, got trees to absorb all the methane gas that comes out of the cattle, you know? Uh, so there's a great correlation with the environment in Hawaii that with, all, with the trees and the grass and by um, absorbing the methane gas and, you know, I mean, local beef, I mean, I, I think is very environmentally sound. I, I, I would agree as well. But another thing I just wanted to bring up is that there's an amazing company called Symbrosia that is raising seaweed that you can feed to the cattle, which then cuts the methane. Oh, yeah, I heard about so, that. Yeah, it's, that's so that's going to be like great. I think from the from a climate change perspective, uh, it's also important to consider what the effects will be to the industry and to grazers themselves, right? So we know that the the climate envelope or the the production mm. of grasses is likely to shift as we see uh, temperatures change, as we see precipitation rates change. And so it's not inconceivable to project a future wherein the current uh, pattern of grazing is likely to need to shift for some operations to continue. As we think, uh, as, as I think we should, think through the, the steps to make those transitions, I think it's important to be considering the manifold, the multi-benefits of good land management that grazers and um, ranching operations can be a key part of. So that we're managing not just for cattle, but also for fire breaks, for hy hydrological function, and can ensure that we have a, a diverse, uh, an agrobiodiverse landscape that's also gonna be able to, to provide more than just the, the calories that we might expect from it now. Right, like one of the innovative ideas is mixing trees and pasture, so silver pasture. And so you get some of those ecosystem benefits of trees. And also, you get beef, so it's you know, well, it's wonderful things. I had one question about what, what do you think about how the pastures look? It is certainly very beautiful. I mean, yeah, in, uh, until Lani, it gets really dry, right? And then, Lani, you do silver pasture in your place, right? You know, uh, well, in conjunction yeah. with um, Hu Honua, yeah. and <clears throat> yeah, we do. Uh, we graze the the eucalyptus trees. 
overall, if, overall though, I mean, just let me go to Derek uh, to, to round us out here. What's your hope for what this industry could be for consumers, you know, in, in terms of the, the future? What's your hope? Well, you know, for us, we always want to support local. I mean, regardless, regardless what it is, especially, you know, local agriculture, because, you know, we, in order for us to be food sustainable here on our island, right, we need to have local proteins, right? And, you know, in the past, being born and raised in a sugar um, plantation, whenever there was a shipping strike, I mean, people panic. And right. even today, they, they need rice and toilet paper. Don't buy a little <laughs> two, two hands hey on the body. I mean, you know. So. I got to stop you now because we're done. Oh, we're, we're done. done. <laughs> yeah. So mahalo to you folks at home for joining us tonight. And we want to thank our guests, Hawaii County Council Member Michelle Galimba and Derek Carisu from KTA Superstores and Kapapala Ranch owner Lonnie Petrie and Hunter Hevelin of Super Sustenance. <laughs> Super Sustenance. No insights next week, but we will be having another town hall discussion on a subject that affects all residents' affordable housing. We'll focus on Governor Green's controversial emergency proclamation that suspended laws to build thousands of homes to help address our housing crisis. Join us for Kako, affordable housing at what cost? Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>